Well, good morning. Welcome to worship today. I like to uh, start. Uh, the Lord kind of highlighted a verse for me from Isaiah chapter 51, verse number three. I'll show you why I highlighted it in a minute here, but then I wanted to share it with you. It says, for the Lord comforts Zion. Uh, we had our fifth grandchild a little bit ago, and his name is Zion. So it caught my attention right away. I had to look at that. But it's actually talking about a part of Israel there. And it says, listen to these phrases. He comforts all her waste places. He makes, listen to this, he makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of psalm. But as I saw that, making a desert into a garden, making our wilderness into Eden, I thought, man, God really is in that business. He's in the restoration business, and he wants to do that in our hearts and in our lives this morning as we draw close. The opening song uh, that we sing today begins with the words, when darkness tries to roll over my bones. And, you know, our world gets like that, doesn't it? Sometimes it's like, oh, man, I just need a break from this. Let's allow, let's ask, let's invite God to turn the desert in our life to a garden today, uh, to turn the, the hard times in our lives into times of victory and joy and thanksgiving as we come to him and as we praise him together. Would you join us in standing as we praise the Lord together? Darkness tries to rule over my bones. When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. It's my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. This power that can break our very chains. This power that can empty out the grave. This resurrection power that can save this power in your name. This power that can break our very chains. There is power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
Amen. You may be seated. That is a great truth that we get to put into practice right now. With our breaths that we have, we are able to sing and we get to keep doing that. So I'm going to quickly go through some announcements so we can stand right back up and continue our worshiping of our Savior. The, the first announcement I have is for small groups here at Community. Jason talked about them a couple weeks ago and he told you about how when we come together here at Community, we have Sunday, and we, we talk and we mingle, and small groups is another chance for us to continue to build that community at a, at a deeper level. It allows us to get to know each other more than we can just on Sundays, and then that community, when it grows, it allows us to support each other in times of need. Uh, it allows us to, to lean on each other when we have burdens, and it allows us to celebrate with each other when we have exciting times in our lives. And that small group session, the next one we have, is starting here on January 20, or, or at least the week of January 28th. Uh, if you want more information about that, there's a couple ways you can get it. You can go on our website, and it'll tell you all the different small groups we have, or you can come up and talk to me, and I would love to get you plugged into a small group. So if that's something you're interested in, please do not wait on it. Let us know so we can get you plugged in quickly. Uh, there's a women's book club that is you uh, reading through the book right now, but they will be having a meeting uh, on Wednesday, January 31st. I think that's correct. Did I say the right day? Yes. Um, and then they will also have another meeting on February 28th to kind of wrap up the book. If that's something you're interested in, Stephanie Graham is running that. You can go talk to her and you can catch up on the reading so that you can be a part of that women's book club. We have a family skate night coming up. This is something that we've done the last few years, and I think uh, one of the years Dan even got laughed at a little bit and a little you know, hurt by how he was laughed at, but that's okay. I think he's recovered. <laughs> nope, the way he's blinking at me, he has not. Um, so don't bring it up. He doesn't like it. Um, but anyway, we have that coming up here soon. That is on February 5th from 6 to 8 down at Nib, uh, Nibco in Elkhart. Um, if that's something you'd like to do, it is $3 for the skate rental, but we'll all be going over there and having a good time. Uh, we don't have a slide for this, but this is something we are trying to start here at Community. We're going to try to be forming a missions team. Um, there's somebody who's going to be, that's volunteered to run it. We have one of our elders who's going to be a part of it, but we need more members of that team. So if, uh, if you're interested in uh, what our church does as far as supporting our missionaries, 
um, and you might want to be a part of that team, please come up and talk to me, and I'll get you plugged in with the folks that are uh, forming that team and let you know a little bit more of what it would entail if you were to be a part of that team. Uh, but we are passionate about missions here, and we, we want to be better at sharing that with you, and we think a missions team will, will help us do that. So uh, that's, uh, hopefully we'll have a slide next week, but that's something that is up and coming here, and if you are interested, please let me know. And then finally, if you'd like to support what God is doing here at Community, there's a few ways you can give. You can give online through our website or the Church Center app, um, or you can do that through the, the boxes that are located by each entrance. Um, so let me pray, and then we'll get back to using our breath to worship like we just sung about. God, thank you so much for community. Thank you for what you are doing here through the different uh, outreach programs we have and through uh, the ministries we have here. We can see that you're working. I pray that we continue to strive to make sure those things are glorifying you. As we worship today, uh, please help us to be focused and um, really, really striving to sing your praises. I pray this year in your name. Amen. Please stand. spoke the earth into motion 
my soul now to stand. You stood before my failures. You carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation. Spirit alive in me, my life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Sing this out, church. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned. indeed what can we say what can we do um but offer our hearts to you uh lord i know as i look even at the next few moments i i'd love to share your truth in an impactful way um but i can't do that i need your spirit so lord i pray that he would minister powerfully uh during this time take your truth and teach us i pray in your name amen you may be seated Okay, before we get into our text, which is in the middle of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, before we do that, just two things I wanted to uh, mention real quickly. One is, um, well, I want to do a commercial, okay? February. I probably should have worked this in last week and this week uh, like that, but uh, in February, we're going to do a series, I don't know, we're going to call it something about winter, like, you know, like the winter of your life. Uh, but what we're going to do is uh, God's Word gives us some tools for dealing with pain and grief and heartache. Uh, one of the main sources of that is in some of the Psalms that are called Psalms of Lament. 
okay, of heartache and, and dealing with that. But they're great resources that we have to learn to cast our cares upon him, to deal with a world that has a lot of problems that we weren't really made to deal with. What I mean by that is sin entered the world and darkness and sickness and disease and all this stuff. And people are like, why is life so hard? Because we weren't made to deal with all this. But Jesus said, I'm going to enter into your life and I'm going to be with you in all these things. I'm going to help you through this. So I'm kind of excited where we're going to take a four-week series in February because February has four weeks, so I put that all together on my own, and we're going to look at some of the songs of lament, so that's coming up in two weeks. For this week and next, we're going to uh, finish up 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, before we do that, one more quick note. Uh, my wife got me these, uh, uh, what do you call fleece lined pants for Christmas, and uh, I thought, it's cold, today would be a good day to wear them, and I did, and then I put the sweater on that my son got me. I got to tell you, I I am really hot. <laughs> so so should I pass out in the middle? I just thought I'd warn you of that. Don't be alarmed, Dennis. If you could come finish the sermon, that'd be a good thing. Uh, somebody needs to take over because it's entirely possible that I could hit the deck at any time. Okay. Uh, we are going to look again at the power of the cross, and we're going to read a section. I think... Okay, you know how they talk about this part of the country as being the flyover section? Really makes us feel good, doesn't it? Uh, you, know, you got your New York and you got your California, and this is the flyover states that nobody cares about. There are some sections in Scripture that I have that I think sometimes they fly, we fly over. Uh, I don't know, you know, what what that's all about. Uh, and we're going to look at a section and really kind of dig into that. We're going to land, if you will, in a in a section like that. Remember last week when we started this book of 1 Corinthians, started to look at that, we said that um, this is a long letter that was written to a bunch of believers who had a bunch of problems. They had legal problems. They had morality problems. They had worship problems. Uh, they had doctrinal problems. And I'm just getting started on the list. They had divisions and fighting. And how did Paul start off his letter? Ten times in the first ten verses, he talked and he pointed them to Jesus Christ. He said, this is where it is, and I want to tell you that I'm going to preach Christ, and I'm going to preach the cross. That's what I'm going to do. Should I give you, you know, ten ways to get along better with other people? No. Here's what I'm going to do. First of all, I am going to preach Jesus Christ. Now, I, when I say that, I realize, okay, you know, pastor stands up, and what was the message today? Well, you need Jesus. <laughs> okay. That sounds profound, doesn't it? Sounds like I belong on a street corner, you know. You need Jesus. And people are walking by thinking, stay away from that weirdo, children. Uh, and I keep, keep going. He, he's a little nuts over there. I realize it sounds so cliche, but again, this is what Paul started with. He said, this is so true. I feel like this a little bit when I get talking about this. I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this. I don't know if this is a great way or not, but my son is, um, he always has a new uh, way that, uh, you know, a health thing that, you know, a health thing that he's on. I told you he was into cold showers. Okay. He's like, dad, this will really help your life. And I'm like, I don't care. Uh, I want a warm shower. Uh, you know, and then he, and then he also, you know, one time he was drinking tea made from the bark of some tree that grows in the Himalayas or something like that. And he had ordered this. He said, dad, this will do this, this, and this for you. I was like, I don't care. Uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the, you know, he, he always has something like he does coconut oil things. All, I don't know. He does coconut oil for everything. I don't know. What it is. Uh, but he always, has these little kicks and stuff like that. Now, listen, he might be right. These things may be wonderful and everything like that. I kind of feel sometimes like I'm like he is, you know, where I'm trying to tell you about something and it's like, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, all right. And push aside. And sometimes I feel like that. You see, I am overwhelmed more and more with the idea that I cannot, you know, we talked about this last week. I can't be the savior to anybody. I can't change anybody's circumstances, and I can't even be with you in all your circumstances. I can be there some, but even with the people I'm closest to, even with my family, I can't be there all the time. So I'm overwhelmed with the sense that what I want to do more than anything is continue to push you towards a closeness to Jesus Christ, that you'll, that you'll walk with him in everything. And, uh, you know, again, I don't want to oversimplify. Oh, all you need is Jesus. But there's so much of that. If we learn to go to him and walk with him when we're having difficulty with people. You know, I found out that when I'm mad at my wife, my relationship with God just doesn't sit well. And by going to Jesus, you know, I, I figure out that, you know, somehow that relationship isn't right. And I have to go back and get, get right with things like that. And so many things like that. When I'm overwhelmed with worry, mad at somebody else or something like that. When I actually lean into 
Jesus and draw close to him. So I have to run back up here. I was scribbling down some of the words. The, the, I think it was the second song we were singing this morning. And I thought, man, if we could learn to walk in this, if we could just learn to have some actual times in our lives where I love you, Lord. <laughs> I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. I have lived in your goodness. And with my whole life, what I want to do is I want to surrender it now. You know, that could actually be part. And, okay, I, please do not think I'm talking down to you when I say this. Well, we're Christians. We all do that. No, we don't. Okay? And I say that from personal experience. I have lived a whole lot of my life and I, with, in the Christian life and in the Christian world without a closeness to God. And I want to push you in every way that I can to know him and to know him better. We have, as kind of a theme around here, I guess, or a motto, what do we call it, a focus, mission, whatever. Uh, connect people to Christ. And it's been around for a long time, and I keep looking at it thinking, we need something fresh and new. But then I think, how can there be anything better than that? I want to encourage you to do that more than anything. Get you connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now Paul's going to continue here, and he's going to talk about this power of the cross, the power of the gospel. So here we go. We're going to read through uh, a section here in the middle of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the word of the cross... Okay, this message of the cross preached is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved by the power of God, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Okay, try to, I know it's, you understand why it's a little bit of a flyover because when you first read it, you're like, what, what? But try to dig in here. Where is the one who is wise? Who is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through, I'm sorry, in the, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Remember that phrase. And it pleased God through the folly of what we preached to save those who believe. That's, I'm preaching Jesus. I'm preaching the message of the cross. It pleased God to save those who would believe in this. The Jews demand signs, and the Greeks, they seek wisdom. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to preach Christ crucified. It's going to be a stumbling block to some and a folly to others. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God that you can have in your life, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, again, I want to I wanna land, land in these verses for a little bit. As we do, I think we will see that there are three uh, set pairs of things. These verses contain... Uh, two different conditions that people find themselves in, two, dish, two different initiatives for bridging the gap between man and God, and two different outcomes. So first of all, as we look at the conditions that are mentioned in the early verses, it says some of you that see this as folly, folly you are perishing. Okay, that word is, means just what it sounds like. If you dig into that and look at the original, uh, we... Uh, you know, since uh, we have become empty nesters, uh, our pantry is not as full as it used to be. Our refrigerator is sometimes downright barren. Uh, we, we don't keep as much food around. And it's kind of funny when the kids come, uh, they'll say, you know, do you have any of this? And friends will say, yeah, I think there's some in there. And my daughter goes, Mom. 2021, uh, like that. We have all types of things. We have a collection of things that are perishing uh, in, a, in, our, in our house. But that, that idea of that, it is rotting from the inside out. And it says, for those who do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who do not have that, that is their condition. They are perishing. In First Corinth, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, right towards the end, it talks about that idea that uh, our physical bodies are doing the same thing. We're perishing or, in, or we are decaying. But it says in there that at the same time, you can be renewed in the inner man spiritually. So what we don't want to be is decaying spiritually, okay? We live in a world that's impacted by sin. Our bodies, whether we like it or not, are decaying, but our, but our spirit does not need to be, for God gives us this new spiritual life, and we don't want to be decaying spiritually. We want to be thriving, and we want to be knowing Him better, and that's what He has called us to. In fact, that verse in Corinthians says that, that while your body is perishing, your spirit is being renewed with God's strength in the inner man. That's a beautiful thing, and that's where we want to go, that we want to, again, know him and that we have the strength to deal with this messed up world in which we are living, okay? So the outer 
self is wasting, the Bible says, but we want to be renewed in the inner man. Well, by the way, one, one last thing about the decay here for a second or the perishing. They say that one of the best signs, if you will, of spiritual decay is if we become more and more content being away from God. Okay, we get comfortable in that. That's why you know, studies say that most people who convert to following Jesus Christ do, do it in the, their younger years. There aren't a lot of people because uh, older folks a lot of times have become comfortable in being away from God. Now, that's not always the case. And, in fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter that God is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want us in this in this state at all. He does not want us perishing. What he wants us is in the other condition, and that is the condition of being saved. Now, this is a positive, progressive word. It is a process going on. Well, wait, 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 Pastor. Pastor, I know you told us that when a person comes to Christ, they have a, an experience of being born again, that new life begins in an instant. Now you're telling us that being saved is a process. Pastor, I really wish you'd make up your mind, uh, not try to confuse us with this idea. Is this, uh, and, you know, and for a lot of us, you know, we, we think of it, we have a lame version of the gospel. We think it's something we believed in the past that it impacts our future but doesn't affect us at all now. And what he's saying is, no, this is an ongoing thing. Let me say it like this, if I can. It is a completed act. The Bible says that very plainly. We are saved, done deal, by, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, saved by grace through faith. It's a done deal, but it makes a continuing process possible. In other words, God is continuing to work on us. I've told you before, one of my bad, one of my many bad habits, I love to read bumper stickers. Uh, it's not always that safe. <laughs> Sometimes my wife will be like, what are you doing? Uh, I want, can't read that, uh, especially as my eyes go bad. <laughs> I want to see that. When I see one of these, you know, cars that have them all over the place, that really fascinates me. <laughs> I got to find out what those say uh, and, uh, and pull up by them. I've only, I actually own my car. I don't really like bumper stickers, so don't put any on there. Uh, but I've only had one in my life. When I was in college, my parents bought me a bumper sticker. It says, be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Okay. And uh, you understand why my parents probably bought that uh, when, I, when I was in college. But uh, they said, be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. But this process is continuing. That fruit of the Spirit we looked at a few weeks ago that God has planted in us in this new life that we have is beginning to grow. It's beginning to take form. It's not fully developed yet. We are continuing again in this process. And the evidence of the completed act of salvation is found in the continuing process. God is working to straighten out that which is crooked. He's, he's, he's helping us to face the battles with sin and winning them more and more often. And he has begun that fruit growing in us. So we find ourselves, everyone in here is in one of those two conditions. Either we are perishing spiritually because we know not the new life that Jesus Christ offers in forgiveness of sin, or we are in the process of being saved, and it talks about that. Yes, it is a completed act, but it results in a continuing process going on in our lives. Now, he also mentions in there two initiatives. One of them is man's plan. Now, you might remember in the verses that we read, it said that the Jews are demanding a sign while the Greeks seek wisdom. Now, I want you to think about this idea of how man is trying to bridge the gap between him and God. Uh, how do many people want to connect with God? Demand. They want to demand something. You say, well, no, nobody would ever do that. Yeah, we all do that some. God, I will follow you if. God, I will believe in you if. God, if you, if you come through for me here, then I'll believe you. I mean, I have heard those exact words come out of many people's mouths. God, if you'll do things the way I think they should be done, God, if you'll answer this particular prayer of mine, then I will follow you. They are demanding a sign. That is one way to try, try to get to God. Not a good way. Not a way that works. How about seeking? Uh, I have to find the answer. I have to figure this out. I got to get to the place where I understand everything about God. I, I want to get, uh, you know, a, a, a sense. Uh, if I can get God to make sense to me, then I will follow him. Okay, don't we see that? Don't we do that sometimes? You know, I'll believe in God if he comes through for me. I'll demand something. I'll believe in God if it makes sense to me. Verse number 21 said this, the world through its wisdom does not know God. 
And these attempts will ultimately end in frustration. I'll get into that more in just a minute as to why they do. But the other initiative is the divine initiative. There's a gulf between God and man that cannot be crossed from one side, from man's side, but can be crossed from God's side. He can bridge the gap. The sheep are not going to find the shepherd, but the shepherd will find the sheep. Uh, is another way that we could say this. And God's plan can be summed up really in two words that Paul used in our text. He used these two words together that really create an oxymoron. They are the words Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Why do I say that's an oxymoron? Because of this. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Did you, did you know that? What's his last name, Christ? Uh, no, that's not it. Christ is the word for Messiah, God's Savior sent to the world. So God's Savior has been crucified. You know, the Bible says that cursed is the, that which hangs upon a tree. makes that very plain. That is a picture of being cursed. So what happens is we ha when I say Christ crucified, we have God's Messiah cursed. It almost doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't fit, fit like that. Now, you know, wait a minute. How can that, how can the Messiah of God become cursed for us? Now, we'll develop that a little bit more in a, in a second here. But I want you to, and I, I didn't uh, put these on a slide, uh, so please listen carefully because I think these statements are very significant that we get a hold of these. First of all, we need to understand God is not obligated by our demands. He is God. And God is not found by searching. But Why? Why do the demands and the searching not work? Okay, very, very important here. First of all, simply, we are finite, and he is infinite. Okay? I need to remember that. I am limited. He is unlimited. We are finite. He is infinite. How can the finite hope to know the infinite unless the infinite reveals himself to us? Okay? So I, if I think somehow, as long as God makes sense to me, I'll follow him, I'm going to be stuck right there. The second statement, we are sinners and he is holy. How can the debtor make a demand on the creditor? If I walk into the bank and say, yeah, I know I owe you $10,000, here's how that's going to work. They're not too crazy about that, but sometimes that's how we want to approach God. Okay? He is infinite. We are finite. He is holy. We are not. Why does, then why can we not demand from him that he do things our way? Why can we not uh, demand that he makes sense to us in every way? Folks, very simply, it is not going to happen. Okay? And I don't, you know, uh, I, I want to say that as lovingly as I can, but that is not going to happen because many people are holding out, you know, when I completely understand God, when God does things the way I want, then I'll believe in him. Not going to work like that. It's not going to work like that. So there are three outcomes. Those who reject this, the Bible uses the word stumbling. I can't say that word uh, uh, being a sports fan without hearing Chris Berman. Some of you know what I'm talking about. He's stumbling, rumbling, uh, fumbling down the road. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, three people got that uh, reference. <laughs> I realize, oh, you got okay, four, we're, we're rolling. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes we... This word stumbling actually has the whole idea of uh, being offended, and this is what being offended means. I've mentioned this before. We like to use that word, you offended me. What we mean is somebody hurt my feelings, okay, when we say that. When the Bible talks about offense, it is talking about somebody who is caused to stumble. And the gospel, that message that I shared a minute ago, that what I said about the idea that God has, that there is a Savior that has been crucified becomes offensive to people. They stumble over that because maybe it doesn't make sense to them. Maybe that's not how they wanted God to do things. And it becomes a stumbling block, and they stay in that situation where they're stumbling, where they're not finding their way. But for others who believe in it, but well, the Bible says it becomes the power of God, and, and read, read this phrase in our text, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So what we get, if you will, when we believe, we have access here to the power of God and to the wisdom of God. Let's explore that for a second. The power of God. Think about what God had to accomplish what, what I mean in, in this way, God has a message that will reach the highest intellect and yet the simplest child. 
God has a message that will convict of sin and yet draw people to him. Those two things don't seem to go together. God has a message that will reach through our fear, that will give us a new hope, that will give us a new destiny. destiny. He says, you can have this power on the inside. I was uh, uh, a couple of the guys that were supposed to ref upward yesterday were late. By the way, did you mention upward? Where is Josh? Did you mention that? Good start of upward yesterday. Evangelistically speaking, we had like 10,000 kids come through here. Okay. Realistically, there was 400, about 400 involved in the program. It had, it had a great start to that. That went real well. But a couple of the refs didn't show up uh, first thing in the morning because they had apparently some car issues. A little fuel line freeze up going on. <laughs> they had let their car sit too long. Uh, wasn't wasn't getting, getting any power. By the way, just on the side here, apparently the electric batteries didn't do all that well in the, in the cold either. So, uh, but, uh, you know, just as the car needs that power, understand this, the fuel that drives the Christian life is this power of God, and what it is is it is Christ in me. That is the hope. That is the, that is the power that we have. So God says you can live in this, in, in, in this new life, in this hope, in this power of God. Uh, this is what you can know through the cross, through Christ crucified. And then the other phrase that is said is also you can know the wisdom of God. Now, in Christ being crucified... The greatest dilemma that faces mankind is answered. Let, let me explain. How in the world can a God uphold his law while demonstrating his love? Okay, I mean, th th think with me here for a second. God loves me, but God is holy, righteous, and pure. He's going to uphold his law, and yet he's going to demonstrate his love. How in the world can that take place? I don't see I get it. I've told you before, um, I have... And please do not revoke my man card, but I have seen my share of musicals. My wife and I have a, you know, she's seen her share of football games. I've seen my share of musicals. And I will confess that most of the musicals, well, some of the musicals, I went overboard. Uh, I've really enjoyed. I, I, I don't mind a good uh, seven brides for seven brothers every once in a while or something, <laughs> something like that. Uh, I'm okay with that. There was one, however, that I would consider, and I'm going to, I'm going to, some of you are going to be like, you're kidding me, that's the best one ever. But there was one that was just pure torture that I, that I watched. It, to, to me, it's Les Mis. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I got a one person agrees with me. Uh, some of you are probably like, that's the best one ever. I hated it. Uh, my wife had a book club that read the book, and then they were like, hey, they're coming to the Morris. We can all go and bring our husbands. Ah! Uh, and we did. And I, I remember it well because the day that we were supposed to go see it, I was on a painting project with some guys from the church, and there was a guy that I told I was going to, and he decided to recap the whole story to me. And he didn't leave out a stinking detail. His recap was longer than the whole stinking play. So all day long I'm painting, and this guy's telling me the whole story. And uh, when he got done, one guy said, so basically some guy stole a loaf of bread and sang about it for three hours. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it. Uh, and you could have told me that, I would have been fine. And I, I can tell some of you are like, this guy's really shallow because Les Mis is beautiful. I'm happy for you, but I ain't never watching it again. Uh, but uh, but any, anyway, the reason I brought that up is I do know enough about the story to know that this, what's this guy's name? Jean? Somebody. Jean Claude Keatley. No, that's not it. Uh, I don't know who he is. Jacques Cousteau. I don't know who he is. Some French guy. Uh, I thought somebody would yell it out. Somebody who knows that. But uh, but anyway, I know this guy stole bread to f because he was starving and possibly to feed his family, too. I'm not I'm not real sure. But, uh, it, you know, I know. So wait. So the whole tension of this is that, you know, this guy, you know, do we punish this guy for what he has done? You know, he stole, if you will, to feed himself or to feed his family. Do we punish him? That is a great tension there. You know, how, how do we do that? How do we, how do we uphold the law in a loving way? And folks, we have a beautiful picture of that right now. And I, you know I hate to bring up something that's going to cause division, but if you look at our southern border, how do we, I mean, I, and I know, I'm sure there are criminals that come across and everything. I get that. But there are also, I'm sure, some very needy people who come. How do we uphold the law? And love them. It's tension. And I don't have an answer. I'm not going to give you one. I don't have one, but that is exactly what I'm saying. In the cross, that's where that tension is satisfied. You see, what happened is this. 
Jesus took the full weight of the law and the full penalty of the law upon himself so that we might know his love. Okay? And if you get nothing else, get that. Jesus took the whole weight, the whole penalty of the law so that we might know that we are loved, so that the, the full extent of the law is poured out on him so that the full extent of love can reach us. That's just an amazing thing here. A songwriter wrote it like this. He said, we worship at your feet where wrath and mercy meet. In Jesus Christ, wrath and mercy meet perfectly. And understand that. And I get, yeah, as I mentioned before, I get more and more impressed with upon my heart what my role is here, okay? Um, you know, the Bible talks about somebody, you know, who gets the lead as being the shepherd, that God puts you into that uh, shepherd. And, and for sure, I want there to be food available for you when you come, you know, some teaching of the Word of God. But so much more, I want so much to get us connected to the great shepherd and get, get you there. Okay, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get away from it. You might be like, Pastor keeps saying these type of things over and over again. I don't know if I'm going to get away from it, but I, I just want, you know, whatever it is will help you to draw into a closeness to Jesus Christ. If that means beginning a journaling experience in your life, whatever that means, uh, you know, somehow developing a quiet time and a closeness to Him, I'm going to keep pushing on that. And yes, I know we're all different, and that will look differently, and I've, men I've mentioned that before. If you read my journal, you'd be like, what in the world? Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be well written out and everything like that, but it, it, is, it has just been so powerful in my life and so needed in my life for me to make sure that I am stopping on a regular basis and spending time with Jesus Christ and talking to Him. And it is so powerful when things become overwhelming, and I don't get it. And, and I've had a, folks, a couple of folks say to me this week, Pastor, this whole death thing and sickness thing, I can't take it anymore, and I get that, and I've been there, and I understand what you're, what you're saying, and when those times come, it is so powerful for me to just stop and tell Jesus what's going on in my life and talk to him and to know him and to draw uh, on his strength that he, that he has for me in my life, and I am going to keep jumping up and down and, and pushing that. Listen, listen again, back to 1 Corinthians. We could go through and we could say, hey, wait a minute. Look, he's addressing immorality here. This is immorality. I mean, I'd be preaching the word immorality. This, this is wrong. He, he is, he's addressing fighting in the church. Some of you, you know, sorry. I mean, also, I need to do that southern thing, <gasps> you know, uh, like that when, when I'm preaching, you know. But I, I, need, to, I need to bring out, uh, you know, the, the, the things like that and, and the fighting and everything li like that. But I, I, I want to start and dwell mainly on where Paul started and dwelled. He said, hey, number one. Number one, we need Jesus to be the center of what we're doing here. And that means we, you need Jesus. I, Pastor, I don't know how to deal with the heartbreak of my kids right now. I'll be honest, I don't know. I, I can't give you something. I don't, I don't have it. I don't have, you know, the pastoral cliche or anything that, like that's going to turn this around. But I do know that in the mess that we live in here, Jesus said this, I will be with you always. Okay, right now, we're in a temporary mess. Just like we are saved, but we're still in the process of becoming more like, like Him. Uh, this world has experienced the Savior that has come to this earth, but He has not set up His kingdom yet, and we still live in a messed up world. And I've got nothing to give you if I don't push you towards a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen. Community, uh, Pastor Josh is talking about it, and it's very important. I want you to have a Christian community. I want you to have a creed. I want you to know what you believe. Community and creed. I want you to have a whole different culture about your life and following Jesus. That would be great. But listen, community and creed and culture are great, but Christ is what we ultimately need. And only as those other things, you know, move us into that relationship with him. I love I would love to see you all be able to take, you know, one of the songs we sang this morning or another worship song that you love and just bow down before Jesus tomorrow morning and sing it to him and praise him. I'd love for you to be able to do that. And I, and I so much want the times that we gather here together on Sunday morning to be a time when 
hey, <laughs> I'm going to keep saying this too. We ain't singing just to sing, okay? We're not doing that. Think about, okay, I'm sharing this with the worship team today. Think about what the early Christians sacrificed to get themselves together to worship God. Don't you think that might be an important thing if they were willing to risk their entire lives to do that? We need this, folks. We need to get together, and we need to, and we need to turn our attention towards him and praise him and worship him. I'm going to invite the, the guys to come back up, the worship team, and is here today, and uh, David and, and Barry and, and uh, uh, Trent are going to come back up and lead us in the song that we started with. Never, never get caught up in going through the motions, Okay. Doesn't mean you have to sing and jump up and down, but maybe, uh, maybe just even close your eyes for a minute and think about what we're singing, uh, stuff like that. Maybe just to stop for a minute and, and think about the, uh, the, the fact that the Messiah that God sent became accursed for you. Why did he do that? So that the law could be met and love could be demonstrated perfect picture of what happened there. May the, may the Holy Spirit of God teach us and help us to understand that truth. Let's stand together and worship some more. tries to rule over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide, and I am not a captive to the lie. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand chance when I stand in your love. This power that can break our very chains. This power that can empty out the grave. There is resurrection power that can save. Your name, power in your name. There's resurrection power. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
Before you leave, let me uh, let me read a passage of scripture over you that um, has become my prayer for myself and for especially for my family. But in uh, the book of Ephesians, in chapter three, the apostle Paul wrote this to the church. He said, "For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the listen, that according to the riches of His glory." He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may live in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. <laughs> My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in his love. I ought to make that into a song and sing it sometime. <laughs> that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend that you may be able to understand with all the saints, with all of those who follow Christ, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. One, one, one last thought here. When you pray, where do you see Jesus? What I mean is you picture him in heaven, sit on a throne. Maybe you picture him in a chair, chair sitting beside you. Both of those are quality. They're good. Do you ever realize that he's here? I know that's, that I might be freaking some of you out. Now he's getting weird on us here. I understand it. But the Bible makes that very plain. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, his dwelling place was the temple. But that in the New Testament, it says that now the Holy Spirit has come and his dwelling place is, the, is in the, his temple and that our bodies are his temple, that he lives inside of us. Just want you to think about that a little bit. Again, I'm trying to do everything I can to say, hey, folks, we got to draw close to Jesus. I don't know. I mean, we might have a great year. Peace may rule in the valley uh, and everything like that, but, uh, or we might have a mess on our hands. I cannot impact the circumstances, but Jesus has said, I will be with you to the end of the earth, and I so much want to, want, want to help you draw close to him. Dear Jesus, again, um, I want to communicate something that is just, it's out of my reach, God. I cannot. These truths are beyond my ability to explain them well. I so much need your spirit to just powerfully uh, minister these things and teach us these truths about you and show us that your desire to have us close to you. Would you, would you show us that, Lord, that, that you just you want each one of us to draw close to you and all these things that are going on in our lives and to walk with you, that you'll walk with them through us? Would you, would you show us that, Lord, that we would do that more intentionally and that we would do that uh, with the assistance, the power that you provided for us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, you may go. Remembering your fear.